stocks and help you pick the right stock at the right time. Good morning, you're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live, India's first digital live streaming business news service. I am Agam Vakil, the headlines. Asian markets are off to a weak start. Stocks in Hong Kong have slipped into a bear market. In selling off the Indian bonds last week was at the highest in four months. The total sell-off was higher than the combined inflow in July and August. The central government is looking to finalize new norms for coal mine auctions after a poor response to recent auctions. And an investigation by the Huffington Post has revealed possible ways to disable security features of Aadhaar. The UIDAI has dismissed the reports. A shifting focus to the US markets which have powered higher on Tuesday, shaking off a subdued start as Apple led a jump in technology stocks and rise in oil prices lifted energy companies. Also enjoying gains were shares of the company that could see a boost in sales in the aftermath of Hurricane Florence. Abigail Doolittle of Bloomberg News wraps up all the market action in this report. Stocks climbed in Tuesday's Wall Street session led by both energy and technology shares. The Dow and the S&P 500 both rose by about four tenths of one percent. The tech heavy Nasdaq outperforming a little up six tenths of one percent. As for that tech strength, the FANG trade really kicked in. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix and Alphabet, those big tech and Internet names climbing about one point seven percent on the day. The best day in about three weeks. Bit of a reversal from some of the declines in the previous week when investors were really focused on the possibility of big tech being regulated by the government. Apple had a strong day, too. In fact, its first up day in five up two and a half percent. This ahead of the product launch event on Wednesday. It was not all bullish action, though, in the tech sector. The SOX or the chip sector, that index, down 1%, really being dragged on by Micron and Western Digital, those shares falling on cautious analyst comments. And turning away from technology, oil. Oil had its best day since the end of June, up 3.5%, having to do with Hurricane Florence. And that hurricane, the possibility that some real damage could be done, really helped out the shares of Home Depot and Lowe's. Uh, both of those stocks hitting all-time highs up for a fourth day in a row. So when you put together the stock gains that we saw in Tuesday's Wall Street session as Haven bonds and the yen declined, Tuesday was a risk-on day for Wall Street. In New York, Abigail Doolittle, Bloomberg News. <clears throat> Well, let's move on and address the Asian markets. And uh, as already suggested, some of the indices in uh, the Hong Kong have already slipped into a technical bear market. At this point in time, we are looking at substantial weakness uh, across the board. Again, uh, not as deep cuts the kinds that we saw yesterday, but we are looking at three tenths of a percent cut for the Nikkei and Shanghai, uh, Shanghai as well as the Hang Seng, well uh, advancing lower. At this point in time, there has been little respite from those. Uh, all the investors as well as traders who have been short in the Asian markets and we're just going to have to wait and watch whether or not there is any recovery whatsoever as we move into trade while well, uh, moving on. But uh, moving on, China will seek permission later this month from the World Trade Organization to retaliate against the United States for failing to comply with a ruling that <sighs> deemed some of its anti-dumping rules to be illegal. Kevin Chirilli of Bloomberg News reports. Well, two things. First and foremost, President Trump criticizing the World Trade Organization in that exclusive interview of Bloomberg News just a couple of uh, weeks ago uh, with John Micklethwaite, in which he said that the World Trade Organization was something uh, that, that he really would, would take a look at. He was criticizing it. But the second point that I would make is that you're seeing China go to the WTO. You've also seen the European Union uh, and European nations also uh, draw towards the World Trade Organization. That seems to be the type of leverage that, that, that these countries uh, argue that they have particularly as the president is threatening $200 billion worth of additional tariffs against the Chinese. But the last point that I would make is that if you go into states like Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and you talk to members of unions, the 40 or 70,000 voters who voted for previous President Obama and crossed over and voted for President Trump, many of the Republican pollsters and even some Democratic pollsters that I speak with argue that the issue of trade and trade deals 
works well for this administration as they attempt to try to get folks to the polls in the midterm elections. Because while many Republican lawmakers are concerned about the back and forth with China, their constituents aren't as concerned. NAFTA is something that folks on the left have criticized, for example, as well as on the right. Right then, uh, well, we did see another weekday of trade in the Indian markets too, and uh, that's very evident in the kind of cuts that we saw in the indices. Let's start off by taking a look at the SX Nifty. At this point in time, it's actually bucking the trend uh, and uh, you know moving against what we've seen in the rest of the Asian markets, up uh, around 36 points at this point. And when it comes to own markets, as I was suggesting, we've seen a cut, another cut of around 1.3 percent on the Nifty, and both the bench, uh, you know, broader market in indices, well, largely moving and falling in tandem with the major indices. It's the same for the nifty banking indices too, with the PSU banking index not falling as much as the major banking index, uh, largely on account led by some of the larger private sector players. But <clears throat> when it comes to some of the other sectors, we have seen sub substantial weakness in the FMCG space. We're starting to see a lot of profit taking coming through, be largely based on the rich valuations in uh, this uh, sector, and pharma index also declining by around 1.6%. In terms of ADRs, we have more weakness coming through. Uh, Tata Motors, HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank, and Dr. Reddy's all falling, and uh, the only stock which advanced in trade was Infosys uh, by as much as 1.3%. <coughs> but for institutional flows, the, the selling has certainly intensified considering the gross numbers were very large and your net number has been over a 1,450 odd crores. DIIs on the other hand did plow back some by as much as 749 crores on a net basis but that was still half of what we've seen from the, what the FIIs have taken out in yesterday's day of trade. But moving in, uh, when it comes to contributors, again, a bulk of your gains, or rather the bulk of your losses, are coming from, well, the entire Nifty 50 pack, save for something like an HDFC bank, ITC, and Reliance Industries, continuing to bear down on the markets and providing that decline of, well, you can say, 50-odd points out there. Uh, there isn't much too much to speak for, considering there were only six gainers on the Nifty 50 in yesterday's day of trade. Uh, coming down to the futures and options space, <coughs> and this is where starting to see some unwinding when it comes to the nifty uh, it really hasn't been uh, absolutely uh, l large volumes when it comes to uh, open interest change, but we're still seeing a decline around 1.6%. But it's not the same for the Nifty Banking Index, where there is accumulation of open interest towards shorts, considering the index comes off by around 1.5% and the open interest rises by around 9%. And once again, the open interest distribution has now come off substantially and decidedly from the 11,500 put to the 11. 1,400 put and of course on the upside we have the 11,800 call which has the maximum open interest but you can see f uh, the 11,600 uh, calls fast picking up pace. In terms of the most active options yesterday once again it was essentially the 11,400 and 500 calls and puts as well there was more writing in calls considering we saw the nifty come off to quite, to quite an extent. But uh, the India Wix uh, surprisingly did not advance as much as one might expect. It did move up by around 1% at around, but were largely hanging around the, about the mark 15. And the Nifty put call ratio fell further to around 1.25 as on expected lines. And it's the same for the Nifty banking put call ratio, but that fell to levels of around 0.58. Uh, and uh, moving on, let's take a look at some of the stocks. So Adani Enterprises, uh, more shots building in. And along with Adani Enterprises, we also have Godish Consumers. That's down as much as 4%, so shorts there as well. <coughs> and we have Muthut Finance, where we're seeing shorts down as much as 3.6%. And uh, well, we have some long unwinding in NIT technologies after the strength that we saw day before. So watch out for this stock as we move to trade today. Uh, that said, the Indian rupee touched a new low of 72.74 against the dollar yesterday. Rising crude oil prices and wider current account deficit continue to weigh on the rupee. Tracking the weakness in the currency, bond yields rose to the highest in four years. What can we expect the regulators to do now? Ira Dugal sums it up in this special report. Another
tough day in the Indian currency and bond markets. The currency hitting another low less than a month after it took out the psychologically important 70 level. Uh, we are now within striking distance of 73, 72, 74 uh, was the low of the day, although we closed a little bit above that. Uh, in trying to make sense of what has changed in the currency markets, and this is a year-to-date chart, uh, which will tell you that the initial set of uh, depreciation that we'd seen uh, was a fairly glide path kind of depreciation, and that's why there was no concern in the market. There were people who were talking about the level of the rupee, at what level uh, it does it work best for the economy, etc. All of those conversations were going on all the way until about uh, the end of July or so. Uh, you wouldn't have heard anybody being particularly worried about the uh, currency, including government officials, till about the end of July. Uh, things have changed since then. Uh, of course, we had that one uh, major gap up uh, to 70 uh, on uh, you know around the 16th of August, uh, and since then, uh, look at the pace of the depreciation that you've seen. You've taken out uh, 72. You're at 72.69. That was the close. You went to about 72.75 in intraday trade. Uh, so the pace of depreciation has certainly changed. Some people say that it is being driven by uh, the NDF market, which in turn is being driven uh, by the emerging market currency complex. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, you have to take note of the fact that the pace at which the rupee is depreciating has changed. And hence, perhaps the analysis of it needs to change as well. Just to give you the numbers so far, uh, on a month-to-date basis, uh, you're down about 5% on the Indian rupee, 5.3. That's a one month uh, comparison across the Asian market, uh, basket. And if you look at a year to date comparison, uh, we are now uh, down more than 12%. 12% depreciation as I was coming in uh, to do this analysis. Uh, the uh, real effective exchange rate numbers came in. Those are down uh, to 114 on the 36 country uh, trade weighted real e uh, effective exchange rate. Uh, so we've depreciated nominal terms uh, and in uh, real terms. Uh, the question to ask is what is going on in the market right now? Uh, you know, yes, there were fundamentals current account deficit, etc. Uh, the oil price story has been playing out. All of those uh, are known uh, unknowns, if you want to call it that. Uh, in the last month or so, uh, what is driving the rupee? Is it oil? Is it the dollar index? Is it expectations? Uh, I think it's a combination of all three. Yes, oil has remained elevated. The dollar index last few days has started to pick up as well. Uh, and the expectations in the markets have changed, with people talking about 70 to 72 being a band. Uh, and then, of course, markets do, uh, you know, outstrip those expectations and they do stretch uh, in either direction so perhaps there is some of that uh, happening as well uh, the reason it's starting to become a little bit of an adverse feedback loop is because it's moving into the bond markets now uh, and that's uh, you know creating its own set of complications uh, so today for instance you had the 10-year bond yield go up to 8.18 percent uh, look at this one month chart of the yield uh, we were at about 770 odd levels and you're now at 820 uh, what has changed so much yes inflation expectations has changed but does that mean that you've gone from an expectation of two rate hikes, maybe three in this cycle, to five rate hikes? Uh, I don't know. Uh, the uh, swap market seemed to be pricing in another 75 basis points in rate hikes. Uh, that was according to B. Prasanna of ICICI, who spoke to us earlier today. Uh, but uh, you know, to justify that, uh, you would have to see the MPC change its inflation targets uh, quite dramatically. Uh, there was some talk uh, today in the market, uh, you know, just speculation uh, of the possibility of an emergency rate hike. Uh, that seemed seems fairly unlikely uh, for a whole host of reasons. Uh, the reason we are saying that is even if uh, the uh, RBI feels the need to intervene in the currency markets right now, uh, it has a whole host of other options before it gets to the emergency rate hike. Uh, the, uh, you know, quickest thing or uh, the thing that they tend to do first is open a separate window for uh, oil companies to take dollars. They have not resorted to that yet. Uh, as a second step, you could perhaps uh, resort to foreign currency deposits. Uh, to be able to justify a rate hike uh, will be difficult because Urjit Patel two policies back had uh, said uh, that they do not use interest rates to defend the currency markets. Uh, the interest rate story is driven uh, purely by the inflation target mandate of the MPC right now. And as an aside, I just want to mention that we are in an MPC regime. So should there be uh, a condition where you need an emergency rate hike, you'd have to call, first call uh, for an emergency MPC meeting. So for all of these reasons, I think the market is sort of overstepping uh, and uh, starting to talk about expectations which may uh, not exactly come through uh, right now. Having said that, there has been a change in the mood. Uh, what was being seen as a needed depreciation in the currency uh, is now starting to look uh, like something that is being driven more by expectations and perhaps fear uh, than actual and only fundamentals. Right then, let's shift focus to commodities and Jayesh Kilnani is joining us to give us all the updates. Good morning, Jayesh. Morning, Agam. Uh, mixed cues coming in from the commodities basket. On one hand, we have uh, crude oil prices which have risen 
and on the other hand we have base metals that have seen a sharp cut in the overnight session on London Metal Exchange. Uh, but first let's have a look at the oil prices uh, which in fact uh, gained the most since August 22nd. Uh, WTI was up about 2.5% and now inching up uh, once again towards that 70 mark and Brent in fact uh, you know uh, very close to the 80 per barrel mark. Now this is largely on the back of uh, positive inventory data that we got. Uh, so uh, the overall inventory uh, declined uh, by about 8.6 million barrels for last week. Remember that uh, the Bloomberg survey did indicate uh, a decline as well. Uh, however, there was a surprise on the Cushing inventory, uh, which in fact declined more than one, uh, 1 million barrels for last week, whereas uh, the survey indicated an increase of about uh, nearly 9 lakh barrels. So that was the major positive for the oil markets. But shifting focus to the base metal space, all of the base metals except for tin ended deep in the red uh, on London Metal Exchange. So we had uh, LME aluminium uh, inventories uh, which in fact dropped uh, half a percent to their lowest level in 2000, since 2008. And as far as uh, you know, uh, the speculative positions on various base metals are concerned, on London Metal Exchange, uh, the zinc uh, net bullish bets have been uh, touching a record low while we have uh, you know a boost in sentiment for uh, aluminium prices uh, the speculators have in fact increased their bullish bets to an eight week high similar is the case with uh, the copper bets uh, where speculators have increased their bullish bets to a 10 week high despite all of this uh, we had uh, you know major uh, sell down in the currency uh, in, in the commodity space uh, anywhere between 2 to 3 percent on an average all of these base metals lost uh, lastly as far as gold prices are concerned we're seeing some bit of stability near the 1200 mark Right, Jais, thank you so much for bringing us those details. But uh, in a report to attract more bidders, the government has moved to revamp its coal mine auction rules. And a committee chaired by former Central Vigilance Commissioner Pratyush Sinha has made relevant recommendations in a report which awaits approval. Bhanvi Arora brings us more details. The government is in the process of finalizing revamped rules for coal auctions. Uh, now the coal ministry is framing these new rules because they had received a tepid response in the auctions conducted earlier. To frame these rules, a higher powered committee was formed, uh, which was headed by former Central Vigilance Commissioner Piyush Pratyush Sinha. Uh, now, under these new rules, government will consider reducing the number of bidders in the auction. They are also going to lower the upfront payment needed for the auctions. Uh, apart from this, they are going to reduce the quantum of uh, bank guarantee for the bidders. Some of the new coal norms will be uh, will need cabinet approval. Now, the first stage of the report uh, framed by the high-powered committee uh, has got cabinet secretary's approval and the minister's approval is left. Uh, the government will hold fresh coal auctions based on these uh, new norms this fiscal year. Right, moving on, we have Shraddha Babla now joining us to give us a list of all the stocks which are in the news and which are likely to move. Good morning, Shraddha. Uh, good morning, Agam. So I'm going to start off with Reliance Capital, which reported its first quarter numbers after market hours yesterday. A uh, good set of numbers, revenue growth of about 5%. Net profit uh, came in at 272 crores as compared to a net loss of 378 crores in the previous quarter. Uh, the the uh, general insurance business seems to have done better and total assets for the company grew by about 6.7 percent. Uh, that apart, you also have Sun Pharma, which has clarified that its Mohali facility is undergoing an inspection by the US FDA. The inspection started on 10th of September and is ongoing. So uh, the investors will continue to track the stocks will remain in focus. IDFC Limited is another one which will be in focus. And this is on the back of an ET report, which says that NIF is close to purchasing IDFC infrastructure finance. Uh, that is a dedicated debt infrastructure fund for about 1,000 crores, so watch out for that name. You also have a Times of India report which says that there are seven bidders which are in race for a PNB housing finance and have, uh, you know, the deal is likely to go through at about $2.3 billion. Uh, they've named Godrej, Bandhan Bank and Diwan Housing as some of the suitors which have submitted a non-binding bid. Uh, now, remember that... Um, 
Earlier, it was said that there were about 13 uh, different uh, suitors which had submitted uh, EOI. Some of them are said to have backed out on account of the valua expensive valuations. So that's the stock to watch. As also Godrej Agrovet and Aztec Life Sciences. Now, uh, Godrej Agrovet has said that they are uh, going to consider merging its subsidiary Aztec Life Sciences with itself on 14th of September. They hold about 47% stake in the company. So uh, important to watch out for that one. As also Reddington. India, which will consider a share buyback on September 17th, so you might see some positive reaction there. And finally, you also have Alembic Limited, which will be in focus. Uh, the board has given approval for demerging certain identified real estate undertaking of the company. Uh, so, what all will be demerged is going to be a premium residential real estate project. Uh, interest that the company has in the real estate business, which is held through the investment in a Shreno Limited and a project management consultancy business. Uh, all of these are going to be demerged and the company has said that this could possibly lead to elimination of all sorts of intercompany uh, cross holdings and it will lead to value unlocking. So Alembic, Pharma, uh, Alembic Limited, sorry, clearly a stock to watch out for Agam. Rashada, thanks for that. But uh, moving on, SEBI will have to take measures to curb insider trading as it is a very complex problem. That is the word coming in from TK Vishwanathan speaking to Jeshri Upadhyay. The former law secretary said that if the recommendations to enhance the surveillance do not work, there can be more drastic measures in store. Listen in. Uh, how else you can get hold of the insider trading? It's a very complex uh, problem. We could not say we has to deal with that problem. So we have to, I mean, somehow we have to corner them. Then that's the only way we can do that. See, I, I think uh, I mean, in practice it will we'll know how it works. Otherwise, we are totally helpless in dealing with this uh, problem of insider trading. Uh, we have suggested the surveillance this and that. But we have moved very cautiously. We have not... Uh, uh, when suggested anything drastic, incrementally we are moving and let us see whether SEBI in the, um, in the long run will be able to deal with this problem, otherwise we will have to suggest something more drastic. Mm. But we have moved very cautiously. But so you also highlighted the fact that SEBI itself is moving in that direction. Yes. Uh, so what is the thought process within the regulator that you were able to understand? No, SEBI wants to do many things but they are handicapped by lack of uh, powers, regulatory powers. Mm. So we are trying to empower them and try to fill up the gaps because right now even the Supreme Court has said that uh, SEBI has to be more proactive. Mm. So we are trying to do that. Mm. And uh, you know, we, I, the securities market is very fragile so we have to be very cautious when we deal with mm. uh, the securities market. Mm. So let us hope SEBI will be able to carry forward the mandate. But sir, there is an argument on the the fact that uh, investor net worth may not be the right way of looking at the exposure to the derivatives market, rather it should be financial awareness. But anyway, anyway we have given the recommendation, SEBI will, SEBI will take a call, SEBI will have take a call, let us see what stand they take, so it's not yet uh, accepted by SEBI yet, maybe they are meeting, they will uh, take this into account. We have thrown up an idea, let us see how does it uh, weigh with the SEBI, because it's for them to uh, exercise that power. Now, there's lots more to talk over the course of the day, and you will find all the live market action on Bloomberg Quint. There are also a few stories that you should consider reading on the website BloombergQuint.com. Here they are. Insurance for mental health and genetic disorders will be standardized and introduced as a part of the basic medical claim policies, according to the head of India's Insurance Regulatory Authority. And the government has advised banks to start a common platform for auctioning defaulters' sized seized properties to attract competitive bids and increase recoveries from the sale of such purchases. <clears throat> and a miner in Western Australia struck the mother load of gold when he unearthed a large chunk of the precious metal worth, well, $11.4 million. Take a look. Water the dirt down, and there was just gold everywhere, as far as you could see.
with that, it's a wrap in this edition of Daybreak. But all you need to know is up next. Stay tuned to Bloomberg Quick.